What is the rarest thing? Somebody sent me this question before, and to you, sir, I ask, what do you mean by rarest thing? Because everything is made up of little things. However, scientifically, there are ways to define what you just said. Because little things that make up everything are the elements that make up matter in the universe. So your question could be, what is the rarest element? Right? The problem is that we immediately hit a problem when trying to answer that question because an element could be rarer than itself. Let me give you an example. But before that, let's discuss a few basics about the atom. As you know, an atom is made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. There is something called the atomic number of an atom, and that's the number of protons that it has. That determines what element that you get. Then there is something called the mass number, and that's the number of protons and neutrons that an atom has, and that determines what isotope that you get. That isotope is what could make an element rarer than itself. Let's give you the example. Let's take hydrogen. Hydrogen has many isotopes. The simplest isotope is called protium, which is basically one proton. Mass number is one. Atomic number is one. Then there is another isotope called deuterium, and deuterium has one proton and one neutron. Mass number is two. Atomic number is one. It's still hydrogen. Then there is something called tritium. Tritium has one proton and two neutrons. Its atomic number is one. If there is still only one proton, and mass number is three. Of all those three isotopes, which one is the most common? That would be protium. Protium, when it comes to all the hydrogen isotopes in the universe, forms 99.98% of all of them. And since hydrogen, overall, as an element, makes up 90% of all atoms, in the universe, this makes protium the most common thing, which is the exact opposite of what we're trying to answer here. So going forward, we have to put in mind that what we're going to take is the most common and or stable isotope of an element when we are trying to answer what is the rarest thing. Good? Great. So with that said, let's begin with some elements that pretty much everyone considers them to be rare. Silver, gold, and platinum. In order to know why those things are rare, we need to know how they came to be here on Earth in the first place. So to do that, let's take a look at those big stars out there. Do you know how these stars formed? Well, generally, in the beginning, there was this big gas cloud made up of the most common element in the universe, hydrogen, followed by the second most common element in the universe, helium. And what happens is that gravity starts to take action and pushes this gas cloud into a single center. And as it does, pressure starts to build up, heat starts to build up, until you reach a point where nucleosynthesis can happen. And nucleosynthesis is a process where atoms could fuse with one another. So you can have a hydrogen atom fusing with another hydrogen atom forming helium. You can have a helium atom fusing with another helium atom. You can have a helium atom uh, fusing with a beryllium atom making carbon and so on and so forth. The process continues until you reach the element iron. And after this point, the star is in trouble. Because before the element iron, generally, the nucleosynthesis process releases more energy than what it would take to fuse atoms together. But after iron, it takes a lot of energy to fuse atoms together. So what happens is that if a star is big enough and it builds a big enough iron core, the star goes kaplami, supernova. Now, if you take a look at the periodic table, you will notice that silver, gold, and platinum are all elements that are heavier than iron. If the nucleosynthesis process in stars stops at iron, how did we get elements heavier like silver, gold, or platinum? Well, you see, I just mentioned that if a star is massive enough, it will continue fusing atoms until it reaches iron. And when it builds a massive enough iron core, it goes supernova. And a supernova is a very energetic event. And this energeticness is what allows this supernova event to break through that iron wall, and it keeps fusing atoms beyond iron. And you get heavy elements like silver, 
gold and platinum. That's how those elements formed. The thing is, Earth, along with all the other planets in our solar system, and even the Sun, were pretty much the leftovers from previous supernovae events. So the silver, gold, and platinum that you see here on Earth are the result of those events. Now, when it comes to the rarest elements here on Earth, it is actually neither silver, gold, or platinum. It is actually something called astatine. And the reason for that... Uh, remember when I told you about isotopes, which is relevant to the atomic mass number of an atom, which is the number of protons and neutrons that an atom has? Well, it turns out that all the isotopes of astatine that we know of, well, they have a half-life of less than nine hours, which is not good. Now, what does that mean, a half-life? Okay, a half-life doesn't mean that an element will disappear in like nine hours. Astatine is not going to disappear in nine hours. So let me just take a couple of minutes to explain what a half-life is because we will need it later on as well to explain other, even rarer things than astatine. A half-life in basic terms is the amount of time for half of an element to decay into something else. Let me give you an example. Let's take the isotope of plutonium, plutonium 244. Let's say that you had 100 kilograms worth of Plutonium-244. Now, Plutonium-244 has a half-life of 80.8 .8 million years. This means that if you wait 80.8 .8 million years after you get this 100 kilograms worth of Plutonium-244, you will find out that half of this chunk would have decayed into something else. Okay? If you wait another 80.8 .8 million years, half of that will decay into something else. And then, if you wait another 80.8 .8 million years, half of that will decay into something else, and then so on and so forth. So, what does that mean for astatine? Well, astatine, the most stable isotope for it, is astatine 210. It has a half-life of 8.1 hours. So, if you had, let's say, 100 kilograms worth of astatine, then it's going to be the same example as plutonium, except you don't wait 80.8 .8 million years, you wait only 8.1 hours. That's not that much. So, in a very short period of time, it's going to make itself go into very minuscule amounts. At any given moment in time, here on Earth, there's only something like 25 grams of astatine. And it's, it's not because it's been deposited by previous supernovae events. No, no, no. It is here because other heavier elements, through their own half-lives, eventually decayed into astatine. And because it's not exactly stable, it decays into something else, uh, eventually. So, that's why it is the rarest thing. However, this is only true if you consider elements that come before the heaviest naturally occurring element. Uranium. There's a reason I gave you the example of plutonium-244, and that is because its half-life of 80.8 .8 million years is the longest half-life amongst all isotopes of all elements that come after uranium. Why is that a problem? It's a problem because of the age of our solar system. Our solar system is 4.6 billion years old. So let's imagine that 4.6 billion years ago we had 80 trillion tons worth of plutonium-244. Because 4.6 billion years is a long time, this means that the half-life of plutonium-244, 80.8 .8 million years, is going to happen over and over and over and over and over and over again. Until you reach a point today where we only have one kilogram of plutonium-244 spread across the solar system. And that's a problem that all isotopes of all elements after uranium suffer from. So is it fair to call astatine the rarest thing? Only if you consider elements before uranium. But after uranium, things are different. But humanity said, screw that jazz, and they started making elements heavier than uranium artificially. The problem is, as you go deeper and deeper into the periodic table, things become increasingly unstable and increasingly difficult to synthesize. It gets to the point where after element 101, all isotopes have half-lives that are less than 28 hours. As an example, if you take a look at the element right at the very end of the periodic table, element 118, ununoctium, we only know one isotope for it 
so far, and that is Urinoctium 294. That thing has a half-life of 0 0.89 milliseconds. Compare that to astatine. Absolutely huge difference. Not only that, elements that are very, very heavy, you could literally count the number of atoms that we have observed for them so far. Ononoctium, so far, get this, we've only observed three atoms of so far. That's it. Another possible contender for the rarest thing is something called antimatter. Yes, I'm sure you've heard of that term before. Now, what exactly is antimatter? Antimatter, in a very basic sense, is just like matter, but the opposite. Now, how does that make any sense? Let me give you an example. In an ordinary atom where you have protons, neutrons, and electrons, the protons have a positive charge, and an electron has a negative charge. But in an antimatter atom, the antiprotons have a negative charge, and the anti-electrons have a positive charge. At the same time, antimatter particles, as soon as they come in contact with matter particles, they annihilate themselves into pure energy. And that makes them very, very rare. You can dig anywhere on Earth and you will not find a single nanogram of antimatter. The only true way to get it is through particle accelerators, similar to how we got super heavy elements like ononoctium. We have to make antimatter. Now, CERN facilities can produce millions of antiprotons per minute, but those antiprotons haven't really become antimatter elements yet because they need to be paired up with anti electrons and that's a nightmarish process on its own if you pair an anti-proton with an anti-electron you would have created the most basic anti-matter atom which is anti-hydrogen specifically the isotope anti-protium remember in the beginning of the video i mentioned that hydrogen is the most common element in the universe it is the exact opposite of the question of what is the rarest thing. And the most common isotope of hydrogen is protium. In order to create the most common atom of antimatter, you still need so much effort and energy in order to create it. To give you an example, CERN managed to trap 309 antimatter atoms for 17 minutes, anti-hydrogen atoms. To be specific and even that was absolutely amazing of course you will now be asking me so what exactly is rare is it super heavy elements like ononoctium or is it the most basic atoms of antimatter like anti-hydrogen both of them suffer the problem of staying put with super heavy elements like ononoctium decaying into other elements through their very short half-lives and antimatter annihilating itself as soon as it comes in contact with matter. I've just told you, at least in one case, that anti-hydrogen, we've trapped 309 atoms of it. But onoctium, as an example of a very super heavy element, only three atoms were observed so far. So you could say that very super heavy elements are rarer than the most basic atoms of antimatter. But that doesn't really matter, because there is still something that is rarer than both super heavy elements of ordinary matter and the most basic atoms of antimatter. How is it possible to have something that is rarer than something we've only discovered three atoms for it so far? The thing that you have to understand is that the periodic table of elements doesn't necessarily end at element 118. There could be heavier elements like element 119, element 120, element 126, possibly even heavier than that. But the problem is it's been proven so difficult to synthesize those elements that not a single individual atom for them has been observed so far. At the same time, I keep mentioning the most basic atoms of antimatter, but there could be more complicated atoms of antimatter. And so far, we have actually been able to observe atoms for anti-helium, but nothing heavier than that yet. There could be 
this anti-matter periodic table of anti-elements and it might look something like this it might look completely different it all depends on how antimatter atoms behave when they're around each other so with that said what is the rarest thing is it those things that have not been discovered yet those matter and antimatter elements that we have not been able to observe a single individual atom for them so far the answer is yes even in the future if we discover for example let's say element 119 or element 120 if we discover anti-lithium or anti-beryllium the answer is still the same we will be at a point in time where there are things that can exist under the laws of physics but we have still not been able to create a single individual atom for them so far and those things are the rarest thing thank you very much and I will see you next time.